village. What do you want? Information. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. <laughs> Hello friends, welcome to Red Ice Creations Radio. Thank you for tuning in to the program. My name is Henrik Palmgren and I am your host. Stop by our website redicecreations.com for much more on all and everything. Uh, it is the third Thursday of March already, can you believe it? Um, and with us on the line we have our monthly regular guest Michael Tessarion. It's a pleasure to have Michael back with us on the show, and uh, we do have an excellent program lined up for you today. We are going to spend some time talking about movies, the symbolism and the messages. We have uh, quite a few movies lined up that we want to get to, so I think we sh simply should get right to it. So let's say welcome back to Ma Michael, and uh, at the same time just mention that the clip we played, played right at the beginning is of course... Uh, from the very interesting 1960s TV show called The Prisoner. I am not a number, I'm a free man. How about you, Michael? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, it's uh, an excellent series. You know, people should definitely watch it because it's uh, probably one of the most symbolic visual, you know, productions ever made, far beyond anything most people have ever come across. And uh, certainly deals with it. You know, concept of what is freedom, and uh, very much deals with the concept that even if you don't have freedom given to you, then you can still be free in your attitude or your mind. You know, yeah, it's your thinking and your attitude that must remain free, it e even if you're a prisoner in every other sense. Sure, I mean, it seems like this is uh, when I'm watch watching the series. It seems like this is uh, a microcosm of the real world, basically, that they're portraying there. Yeah, it definitely is. Hmm. It's a very brilliant series, you yeah. know, we, hopefully we can get to talk about it a little bit more. So, um, excellent. We have, you know, as we said, we have, we have quite a few uh, movies lined up that we want to, to talk uh, about today, or, or get into, rather, but uh, we, we have a few recommendations, so we do want to kind of get, get those out of the way, so to speak, right away. Yeah, uh, you know, just uh, I want to make very clear, since this is being recorded, this is not a, you know, a show about Michael Tassarian's favorite movies or anything like that, you know. If we mention a movie that I actually personally have as a favorite, I'll definitely mention that. But, you know, we're talking here about the symbolic quality of very exceptional films that I think that, you know, people should know about and uh, look into. And just uh, we're talking again about symbol literacy generally in life when it comes to advertisements, you see, or media or video games or, or even symbolism, art. It's very important for people to realize the subtext subtextual um, messages that come across and since people watch a lot of movies and since movies are now in our day and age you know a million dollar creations they're yeah. in your face yeah. it's uh, actually handy for people to watch them objectively also like a critic and see some amazing stuff that's you know being told to us through the films yeah but again just just to emphasize you know if, if we come across a favorite movie of mine i will mention it but that's not what this show is really about sure yeah as for recommendations yeah i've got a list I mean, the list could be endless, but, you know, some really stand out. And when we were talking, you know, before about doing this show, I, um, I wanted to, you know, start thinking back then of, of movies that I have really felt, you know, were very, very excellent and very strongly recommend people to get to see them. But the first one I'd like to really recommend is the movie Educators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this is with a K, e, Educator with a K. Yeah. And uh, it's not widely available. You know, uh, it was a German film. It may even have subtitles, as far as I know. But I, it's one of the most outstanding films I've ever seen and deals with some very powerful motifs. We, you know, we don't really even have time to go into mm -hmm. explaining the story, but uh, it's about a group of kids, basically, or younger people, who really want to try and change the system. And it's about, actually, how would you really go about that and what are the pitfalls in, in your consciousness and also physically, you know, that stop 
to mm. stop a rebellious process from taking place. Mm. So that even when you've got all the passion and conviction in the world, you know, and, and also it goes into the question of whether you're even right. Is, is, is it right to even want to change the system, you know, mm. to change Big Brother, to change the corporatism of our world? You may desire to do that, but is that desire even right? And then even how would you go about it? So, But it's so well done. I think it's an absolutely remarkable film. The acting is stupendous. Mm. You know, and it's a, again a low-budget, independent-style film, but it's something people must make a big effort to try and get to see. In my, in my opinion, mm, very interesting. Uh, educators with a K. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What else we got on the list there was uh, the recommendations. Uh, we have. Let's see. Le, le, uh, should we bring up Ridley Scott right away? Blade Runner, Kingdom of yeah, Heaven. Yeah, Blade Runner. I, I mean, a lot of people have already seen that film, and it's very well known. Sure. But definitely go for the director's cut. Watch it multiple times. It to me, it's one of the most outstanding movies ever made. The reason why I think it's great, and uh, it is actually one of my favorite films, is because it's it sort of parallels the Frankenstein story mm. uh, lightly. Obviously, obviously, it doesn't deal strictly with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but yeah. it has this Promethean, Frankensteinian um, ending. Absolutely, yeah. You know, with this yeah. prodigal son coming back, and I actually believe that the acting in that film by Rutger Hauer is his best. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's so moving to me. It's, it always has been. Yeah. It's very demiurgic. It's a very Gnostic film. Certainly. You know, without going into the whole thing about genetics and, you know, <laughs> the owl of the Bohemian <laughs> Grove and the Thai Rail Corporation is the tyrant elves. Yeah, yeah. You know, what you pick up in Vanilla I, uh, Vanilla Sky. Sure. The, the whole idea about the Ellies and the Illies. Well, yeah, there in Blade Runner, you have the Thai Rail Corporation, which is a fusion of two words, tyrant and L. Yeah. And, of course, their corporation looks like a big black pyramid. Yeah, those are amazing, those, <laughs> those structures, yeah. But the whole idea just of the uh, eternal, immortal, hmm. the, you know, the immortal, mortal concept, which is a huge motif in mythology, hmm. and then seeking out your creator, you know, yeah. and finding out that your creator is, in fact, a limited, <laughs> you know, pretty much demonic, self-serving person, Yeah. who has hmm. treated you like a sort of an object. This goes back to the whole Nephilim concept that human beings are just made, you know, as, as chattel. Sure, yeah. You know, fantastic elements in the movie, uh, and, uh, you know, and we have the unicorn and stuff like that. It's just an amazing film. Absolutely, and I remember regarding the unicorn because there are uh, different cuts of Blade Runner. There are the director's cut and the 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 one that is previous to that when he actually has the the narration of um, uh, Harrison Ford to it. And uh, I like the narration aspect. Yeah. It brings back the old Humphrey Bogart, you know, sort of uh, Sam Spade or, you know... Sure, film noir kind of... Yeah, yeah. The film noir over narration, which I have always liked. I don't know if Ridley Scott wanted that originally, I don't remember. Was that his choice? Uh, no, I, I think uh, it wasn't, because what I've read about it, it was that uh, the film company said that the, 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 the film was too difficult, so they have yeah. to have the guy, you know, in there explain a lot of it, so... <laughs> I heard that, and I, I usually I'm against explanations, you know, I like the minimalism quality. Sure, sure. But since the film was very film noir like it, it kind of worked in a way to have the dialogue I, I why they i remember now that why they put the dialogue in is because they really wanted that happy ending you know where they all drive out of the blackness sure into yeah. this you know sort of commercial setting <laughs> where the sun is shining and there's rolling hills yeah you know that's nonsense i yeah. mean that is other you know, but tacked on endings what, what are known in the trade as tacked on endings mm. are as old as the 1930s you know there wasn't there wasn't even a movie from the horror genre uh that didn't have this unbelievably bad, tacked-on ending. Hmm. <laughs> you know, my mind goes to the movie Boris, you know, which Boris Karloff was in, The Mummy. Mm -hmm, yeah. The great yeah. Carl Freund movie, which is, in fact, one of my all-time favorite films. It's one of the greatest movies, in my opinion, ever made. Hmm. Black-and-white version of The Mummy. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's an exceptional movie to the point where it has scenes within it that are almost non-existent in other films. Hmm. You know, they've barely been paralleled, you know. It's like a great composer or a great pianist, you know, like... Uh, Rachmaninoff, somebody, you know, not even been able to use the fingers, hmm. fingering style of a great composer like that. Well, this is in the same way, uh, the genius of the people behind that movie, it's almost been so far above the heads of most other people that they haven't even bothered you know, duplicating it. Hmm. You know, certain scenes with the female, per, for instance, the strength of the female character in there and the whole dynamic that revolves around the feminine character. You know, you have to go into Werner Herzog, you know, and Vim Vanders and other people to find any comparable type scenes hmm. to to rival the Mummy. It's such a fantastic film. Mm, interesting. That would def that would definitely be one of the recommendations. What else do we have on that list? Uh, we have um, Jacob's Ladder, Hellboy. Jacob Ladder, yeah, excellent film. 
uh, well, you know, again, I like it because it's the dark side of consciousness. Mm. You know, beautifully, you see that I like movies like V for Vendetta and, and movies like that that sort of fuse and, and Fight Club, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, sure. You know, I like movies that infuse a very psychological type of movie, but they're also talking about government conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people think, oh, it was a great movie. They don't realize that two very intriguing things have been connected there. Yeah. This inner problem or inner conflicts of man within his inner republic mm. fused incredibly well mm. with the idea that there's some, you know, sort of government apparatus working, you know, Big Brother, sure. or whatever, and the movies that really bring that out is Jacob's Ladder and V for Vendetta and Fight Club, you know, yeah. those are exceptional movies from those points of view. Yeah. The other one you said is Hellboy, that, that Hellboy is definitely one of my favorite, personal favorite films. Mm. Uh, I don't really want to say too much about it, except that it's loaded with tarot and alchemical symbolism. Mm. Um, it also deals with the understanding of the dark nature of the so-called negative emotions, especially the emotion of anger. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think that people who have been following my work where we talk about the dark side of consciousness and the uh, new relationship that we need with the dark guardians of our own, um, you know, we've been conditioned to believe that our own emotions are something <laughs> negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesus, how did that ever happen? I don't know. But, well, Hellboy, to me, the subtext in that film is very, very much about that. It's also about the, the character Hellboy. Mm-hmm. You know, hell is not what the Christians made out. The mm-hmm. underworld cycle or hell was an old Scandinavian idea where the hell was the place you went to meet your dark guardians, to mm. em- embody those, to reconnect with those, to pass the tests that they have, or in Jungian terms, to actually meet the shadow. Mm. Like, uh, you know, we've been speaking also with uh, Paul Levy about stuff like that. Well, meeting the shadow, that's what hell boy represents, and a lot of the movie involves the underworld, going into the underworld to face, you know, entities yeah. that are called daemonic or demonic. But, uh, the, again, a very strong female character there mm-hmm. who's been repressed by society and who's deeply repressed, a person who was so unique when she was a child and who had a free flow of her emotions and who was empowered by a good, positive relationship with her so-called negative emotions. Mm-hmm. Society then, of course, frowns on that, so the girl ends up in a lunatic asylum for the most of her <laughs> life. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And the movie opens basically where you know this girl is interned, literally has been locked up, because of the powers that she possesses as a young child because she didn't repress her emotions. So the concept of the repressed female connecting with the shadow is a very, very old motif going back past the Dracula movies, Mm -hmm. past the the mummy horror movies, and all the way back into great literature. Hmm. And uh, just, you know, the movie is laced for... So for anyone who wants to deal with alchemy or um, psychology or, or, or Jungian psychology or whatever, you know, Hellboy is a movie that will really intrigue you. It's absolutely yeah. multidimensional. Film. Absolutely, and uh, e- even, you know, you get a pinch of, you know, uh, the connections between the Nazis and the, the occult in there too. I mean, that's oh, yeah. fabulous Again, stuff. tying in with, you know, that there's an outward conspiracy as well. Exactly, yeah. And also the whole idea that Hellboy and the girl and other f- so-called freaks are literally being used as scientific experiments by the elite. Exactly. You know, yeah. Tying into that whole Russian thing about using clairvoyance and, and mystics and uh, you know kines- people who can do all sorts of kinesthetics, sure. literally being you know used by think tanks. I mean, there's so many dimensions to that film. It's not even funny. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and people you... should read the book. You know, people should read the comics mm-hmm. when they're talking. When we're talking about movies like Fight Club or V for Vendetta, you know, people I encourage them certainly when we talk. If it, you know, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. For goodness sake, go and pick up the books. Don't just believe this is all on the silver screen, you know. Sure, sure. But uh, who who is behind Hellboy, by the way? It was what's his name, Giacomo. What's his name? He he's now made a new movie, the uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Ah, uh-huh, I see. Okay, that's the guy. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his name is escaping me right now. It's we'll Spanish. Have to look it up. We'll, we can link to these uh, movies we're talking about on the Red Eye site, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, we'll we'll do that. Yeah. Um, all right, so we got uh, some more here. Uh, one hour photo. Oh yeah. Absolutely amazing film. Uh, Robin Williams, probably the greatest acting he's ever done. This is a small, uh, low-budget, um, independent film, one-hour photo. You know, box office flop, not too many people have watched it. Ro- Robin Williams pretty much.